Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for a learning and growing webinar on teaching a flex hybrid course. Our presenter today is Michelle Meadows of Tiffany University. My name is Sergio and I'll be your moderator for Hawks Learning. We will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions you have into the Q&A module as we go and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. I'll now hand it over to our presenter. Good morning and thank you for joining. My name is Dr. Michelle Meadows and I will be presenting to you about teaching a high flex course. Um, just to give you some background on myself as I get my presentation going, I am a, an uh, associate professor of education at Tiffin University and I've been there for eight years. And prior to that, I taught middle school, math and science in Ohio as well. So just to give you um, an introduction to kind of get, get into the topic, um, the pandemic has forced, as we know, teaching and learning to transition and to transform our traditional classrooms into incorporating more technology and more flexibility for our students and incorporating an online learning into that as well. Um, and so this has kind of become the new normal post pandemic in order to meet student demands and campus needs and also look at ways that we can increase retention and enrollment of students. So for today's presentation, I will talk about my experiences using a high flex model. This high flex model was brought on as an idea from our faculty development committee and they asked some of our faculty if anyone was willing to participate in this pilot study and so two um, myself and one other professor did this this semester and so we shared our findings here um, but she was not able to present today with me so I'll be sharing some of her reflections and her findings as well so um, this, uh, this study or this project consisted of college students from multiple programs. So within my program, I teach the general education courses, which is more like a qualitative research class, while my colleague taught um, in the psychology program and all of the students were juniors and seniors in this study. So we'll start with the definition of what is a high flex classroom, if this is something that you're not familiar with. According to BD 2019, a hybrid flexible or also called high flex course is defined as a design which enables a flexible participation policy whereby students may choose to attend your class face to face online or asynchronously. So for the purposes of this study, we allowed our students to attend class in person, face-to-face -face live. We also Zoomed our classes in so students could join in from their homes or from their dorms and watch class live and ask questions live, or our classes were recorded each day. We have a um, Yuja recording or a, um, a class recorder in all of our classrooms. So students could watch that recording at their own at their own pace or at their own time. So that would be that they were engaging asynchronously. So when setting up a high flex model, there are four fundamental principles defined by Beatty as well. So the first one is learner choice. And we made sure to incorporate learner's choice or providing alternative participation throughout the course by allowing students to join in the variety of ways. And also making sure that we did not take points for attendance. So attendance was tracked, but it was not part of their grade. And that way students could choose each day. We had class twice a week. So they could choose each day if they wanted to attend in either three of those modalities. And they did not have to let us know each day how they plan to come to class. The second option is equivalency. And with this one, we wanna provide learning activities in all modalities. So whether a student is in class or online, we made sure that when students were turning in work, they were turning in work in the same way. All students submitted their work virtually. Um, when students were engaging in a discussion, we had those discussions posted in the course. So even if a student was in class, they were still engaging in that discussion um, online in the modality so that it was equal across all three ways the students were engaging. And then the third option, reusability, making sure that artifacts that you're using in the classroom are reusable um, and that they are 
artifacts that can be accessed by everybody. So anytime we had presentations or videos or resources that we shared, we didn't use paper handouts. We made sure that everything was in the course shell within our learning management system. We use Moodle and um, that the PowerPoints and presentations were able to be accessed by all students in the same format. And that goes along with accessibility. So um, with the beginning of the class, when we started this up, we told students day one, surprise, this is, a, this is going to be a high flex model class. This is a pilot study and you have these three options to join. But if students did not have um, the access to join in the preferred mode, for example, if a student wanted to join virtually, but they didn't have the internet capabilities or a computer or a device to join, we made sure that we worked with our technology department to offer those resources to students so that they were able to access the course no matter which mode that they decided to participate in. So what we ended up doing uh, over one semester, there were two professors at our university that used this high flex model. There were a total of three classes I taught two and my colleague taught one with a total of 66 students. So we wanted to collect not just um, student perceptions, but also data to determine whether this would be successful at our university in particular. And, um, and if so, how we could improve on this process. So um, this was a learning mo modality for both of us. So I'll share some of the things that we learned. Um, we used Moodle as our LMS and we kept all of our content labeled by week. So the students would know which week we were in. And that was um, how we also kept track of the data to see how students accessed and what they accessed in the course. We used lecture capture. So each of our classes are on a timed recording device. And um, those lectures we can share in the learning management system with our students. And we also used Zoom um, to, to, to allow our students to join in and to record those Zooms as well. So students could choose to watch the lecture capture videos or they could choose to watch the, the Zoom recordings and, and engage with um, the discussions that were posted in that Zoom and maybe student questions live during that Zoom as well. So we did collect a lot of data and um, we're still working our way through all of it, but we did three surveys, one at the, at the initial week to see their perceptions and, and how they felt about hearing about this option, this new way to engage in class. Then week seven, our, our kind of our midterms week, we did a second survey that was very similar to see their perceptions. How are they feeling now that they've kind of have a better understanding and um, feeling for what high flex learning looks like. And then we just completed our week 14 survey. Um, we have about half of the students that have actually responded. Um, you'll notice that each, each survey that we have done, we have collected less and less students that have been responding to the surveys, um, most likely because week one, everyone was in person. And then after that, they got to choose how they wanted to attend class. So um, they're also choosing whether they want to um, probably read and respond to all of their emails as well. And it is a busy time in the semester. Um, we also collected how they chose to attend each class, what their current grades were, the time that they spent in the course, and what videos they watched, whether they were Zoom or lecture capture. And with the lecture capture, one nice thing is you can actually see what percentage of the video that they watched. So with Zoom, you can see if they watched it or not, but um, you can't always see the, the statistics on did they watch the whole thing or did they only watch like four or five minutes of that. So with the two um, faculty members, myself and our second professor, we used a variety of ways to set up our classroom. So I identified as the first professor and I used Zoom for students to join in and so did my colleague. Um, I also used the Yuja recordings that were the, the lecture capture recordings. So I would share those recordings after they were ready for students to watch what actually happened in class. Um, we both used Moodle to keep all of our documents and to keep um, all of our resources for students by the weeks. I also used Google Drive. So with this, I chose to use Google Drive as a way for students to share a folder with me as a working document, because what my class is based on is a large research project. So I kind of would check in with them and um, do non-graded assignments throughout some weeks where I could still check in and see the progress that they were making and provide feedback. And um, 
and non-graded checkpoints along the way. So the second professor or my colleague used an owl camera. We only had one on our campus. So she got to use the owl camera and um, use that to allow students to see a 360 viewpoint of the room if you're not familiar with how those work. And so the ones that were joining asynchronous or joining um, online or virtual during the class time can see not just the professor, but they can also see the screen and they can see all of the students in the classroom. So they get to like have a, a, um, a 360 experience while those that joined on Zoom in my classroom really only got to see myself and the screen because I would project what we were doing um, in there. But with both the OWL and Zoom, we did have students who joined virtually express that they still had a hard time hearing. So um, we we need to look into better, better devices or better technology for our classrooms with regards to microphone usage, or maybe the placement of where that owl camera is, or the placement of where our students are. I know her student, her class sizes were much smaller than mine. She had about eight students, while I had around 28 students. So um, maybe her students needed to sit closer. And then she also used the app called Remind, where um, she learned about that because she has children and her children's teachers used Remind. So it's a way to communicate through um, kind of like a text messaging portal that does not connect to your cell phone number. So she would um, communicate with students through Remind in that way. I only used Moodle and I used announcements in Moodle to communicate with students or private emails if I only needed to contact um, you know, one or two students at a time. So this is just an example of some of the data that we collected. Um, we did keep track of how students attended, whether they watched the Zoom or the lecture capture video, and if so, you know, the percentage of it. Um, resources that were posted in the week. So this week, for example, had a PowerPoint. If they, if they accessed that, we could look in Moodle and see what they clicked on. And if they did, we would um, identify that they did look at the PowerPoint. We can't see if they looked at all of them. Um, but I had a Google folder that had all the PowerPoints in it. And that's another thing is this data is not 100% accurate because I did have some students that said, well, I just downloaded the folder week one and it had all the resources in it. So they didn't need to go back and look again because they, they had them the first week with the um, course already being set up. We kept track of the time they spent in the course and whether there was an assignment that week and whether that student in particular had completed um, the assignment and what their grade was on that as well. So um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background on our students, I did say that they were, they were undergraduate students in counseling and general education classes, and they were uh, mostly juniors and seniors. We did have seven sophomores, but a total of 65 students or 66, one did not respond to the first survey. Um, and so when asked about their responsibilities outside of class, we had over half of our students express that they are either working part-time or they are in athletics. Um, and so this kind of reiterated the idea of why flexibility is so important for our student population and um, why we're doing this type of pilot program in the first place. Initially, we had students do with the week one survey where we had them share with us their perceptions of, you know, how do you feel about the class and what do you think about using high flex as a learning model? And um, looking at this, we had, you know, many initial findings that aligned with research, but also, you know, some keywords that emerged from the student surveys were the words love, flexible, choice, health. Um, and these initial responses align with research that stated extra flexibility enables students to feel less anxious in a more inclusive atmosphere, and that a high flex model um, has shown to improve well being and mental health. Some quotes that really stood out to me, students that students mentioned were, I truly wish this option was available for all courses offered on campus. As a full-time college student, full-time mom, and also being human, I appreciate this option of education. And uh, I had two more. I like the options. I have never had a class that admires mental health and my well-being so much. So I love that I can choose when I can come to class without being penalized. 
And I love the idea due to the flexibility and freedom of choice. It allows me to manage my time properly as I have other duties to fulfill other than just college, whether it's a job or internship. It also gives me a sense of responsibility, which is nice compared to other classes where they think all of us are irresponsible. So flexibility is the, you know, number one or is part of the definition of high flex, hybrid flexible. And with all of these, the students are identifying and realizing that this gives them flexibility and it supports a diverse community of learners when we have students that are working or that are parents or that are athletes and that, um, you know, they have very demanding lives. And I have a lot of students also that had a lot of health issues, whether that was physical or mental health issues. And so um, really this was their initial, initial response. There were some initial concerns as well. And um, these, were, these were some of the quotes that stood out to me here. Um, but I did find it very interesting that with regard to the initial concerns, there were multiple students that expressed that they knew that they themselves would take advantage of this opportunity of this course structure, or that they felt that other students, they were worried about other students taking advantage of this flexible option and not doing well um, and slacking off or even ruining this opportunity for other students who could do well in this type of atmosphere. So that was very um, interesting that they were looking out for each other in that initial survey. So we did ask them week one, how would you plan on or how do you plan on engaging in this class? Now that you know what high flex is, um, what do you think that you will do to join class? And so these were their response responses. Some students, um, as you can see, a majority of students said that they, they initially planned on attending in person. And nobody said that they would just zoom in, which I was kind of surprised by, honestly. Um, and there was a, a small percentage that said they would choose to utilize all three methods. So this graph is just showing how they plan to attend. And maybe because, you know, week one energy is high, students are feeling motivated, they're excited about their classes, they've not been used to or they've never had a high flex option before. So they feel they felt at first that I'm going to attend in person because that's normally how I how I do school. And that's what I'm used to, and that's how I've done well in school. But you'll notice that midway through the semester, we, we were tracking how our students actually attending, and that percentage for in-person greatly went down. 17% um, actually attended in person. Zoom increased slightly, um, but there was a large percentage of students that were deciding at this point to join in and engage in class asynchronously on their own. So um, you'll also notice that the number of responses went down as well because a lot of students were not in class and were not I know, forced to um, do the survey. And so we sent this out multiple times through our course announcements and through email asking them to complete the survey, but the surveys were not graded. So there was no um, punishment for not, not completing it as well. When asked midterm how students felt about their own motivation and um, why they may have been, you know, not so motivated, this was the data that that we found so far. So with reviewing the feedback on that, they self-evaluated their motivation during week seven. A majority of students expressed a high range of values on a scale of one to 10 and expressed the following reasons for their motivation. So they said that you know, I treat this class similar to my other work. I'm self-motivated. I'm always giving forth effort. I'm, I'm constantly thinking about my work. I enjoy class and I enjoy the flexibility. So I'm able to do this on my own. While other students express that they weren't very motivated and their lack of motivation was most likely due to the theme of procrastination. And, and why they were procrastinating, many students expressed because of their priorities. Uh, they needed money, they had to work. And so work became a higher priority over doing school and being involved with school, uh, family issues. In addition, so students were saying that they didn't like to do work outside of the class time. So even though they were deciding to join on Zoom or not join and just do asynchronous 
they were not kind of allotting that class time to do the work. And because they weren't in class, they weren't motivated to do the classwork. Um, students expressed they struggled with time management and um, that they did I identify and realize that they needed to make improvements in themselves without us saying anything to them. So they were good at self um, analyzing why they may have been procrastinating or not as motivated in this type of modality. So we did look at some predictors of student success. We ran a couple um, statistical tests that I'll just kind of summarize here for you. Um, we found that the prior, so if students had experience taking an online course before engaging in the high flex model, those students had an increase in their rating of self-efficacy. So when they reported their own self-efficacy scores, if they had experience in an online environment before, they rated themselves higher. Also, those students who had prior online learning experience were also the ones that had higher self-reported motivation scores in our surveys. Um, when we were tracking student grades, those that had attended in person, whether it was a mixed modality or they were consistently in person, those students had higher grades than the non-attending in-person students. And when we kept track of how much time students spent in the course, there was no correlation found between the amount of time they spent in the course and their motivation or the amount of time spent in the course and their grade in the course. And if you'd like more um, of, the, of the actual numbers, I can share those with you as well. Um, we also asked about their final student perception. So this was last week's survey. Um, we asked whether the students would be, you know, are you satisfied? Are you happy with the high flex model? And 92% said they were satisfied. And those same 92% also said that they would recommend this model for other courses. Um, but what's interesting is 78, only 78% 78 felt that they got as much out of the course as they did a traditional course. Um, so this was on a on their final survey, and 67% preferred to stay in the same modality. So they stayed attending class in person, or they stayed attending class in Zoom. They didn't switch up their modality each week. So 67% kept they were consistent with it, their attendance each week. Um, and so some some student quotes that stood out here and why they expressed that they were either dissatisfied. So the students that were dissatisfied, the 8% that were not satisfied, and one of them said working a lot made this class hard and I have mixed emotions. The Zoom was right there, but learning in person makes it easier on everyone, including the professor. And another student said, I'm a procrastinator and it's always hard for me to get motivated. But it's not really the high flex model's fault. So really, you know, would it have mattered if the class was in person or if it was fl as flexible or would the student procrastinate either way? Um, when recommending the class for other courses, this type of model, high flex, one student said, yes, possibly for other writing courses or more general courses, but not for things that really need the in-person connections. And another, per there were a lot of students that said yes, but it depends on the class. And a lot of students expressed that um, they would not recommend this for their major specific content courses, but they would recommend it for a lot of their like general education courses, which is what I teach um, currently. And then with regard to that they felt as much out of the course as a traditional course, um, one student mentioned that you know, they were not able to be in person and build relationships. And so the two, there were a couple of students that brought up this idea of really having relationships with a professor, being able to ask questions, feeling comfortable, building relationships with their peers, but the students did have the choice to come to class. So if that was really important, I would, I would question then why didn't you come to class if that was really important to you? Um, but because they didn't have to, it's easier maybe with their schedule to choose remote or um, to choose to be on Zoom. So I found these um, really interesting that, you know, students felt that they enjoyed the class, they were satisfied, but also 
a lot of them, not as many of them felt that they got as much out of the course because more of it was based on relationships and um, being engaged and not procrastinating as much. Not many talked as much about the content, but probably because of the type of class that I teach, it wasn't a math class or a science class. It was a research class where they were all working on individual projects on their own, um, looking up articles, reading articles, summarizing, doing a literature review. And so um, it wasn't me lecturing each day. It was a, a modeling of how to do a, um, a research project. So some reflections, this is from uh, myself and my colleague, you know, when we're looking at class size, there were some days when I, I would go to class and, and take it, I had, you know, 28 and 26 students in my classes, and there was one day there was a business career fair, I had one student join in person. So um, there, there were some days, I, there were never days where nobody was there. There was always at least one person in, in the classroom. But when there was only a few students, it would make it kind of difficult to do any, obviously difficult to do any group work, any partner group um, activities. It was harder to do discussions. And so, you know, that's something that you would need to plan for. If this was um, a way that you wanted a model that you wanted to use in your classroom, um, maybe having a backup strategy if your if your goal was to do a discussion or to do an activity with students in class and having them engage with those online. And if there were very few students in person or on Zoom, um, it can make that very hard. And also trying to figure out how to make it equal for everybody, because if you're doing an activity, we wanna make sure that those students asynchronously can also do that activity so it's equal. And that was, that was a challenge. Um, because so many students chose to be asynchronous, this really impacted the, um, the class experience. I mean, I think, uh, both of us felt that way. And so, um, you know, as, as much as students really seem to appreciate the flexibility, we would hate to take away that option for them to be asynchronous, but maybe, um, maybe pre-choosing how many times they could be asynchronous um, or choosing which classes, like already setting it up in your syllabus and saying this class is going to be asynchronous, this day we're not, and having the um, high flex model not as flexible um it, you know but that's really up to you and how you would want to want to run it but that was just something we were considering um so many students but joining asynchronously or not really coming to class or not really joining on zoom you don't really get to know or at least we felt like we didn't really get to know our students as well as we would as when they were in person or or even if they were on zoom if they didn't have their camera on um, it was still hard to to try to make that connection with them and not many students wanted to use their camera and we struggled with making that mandatory or not um, we did not require it because we did allow students to be asynchronous so we felt that if we did require it we might be pushing students away from wanting to join on Zoom if that made them feel uncomfortable. Um, with regard to resources, most publications on this idea of using a high flex classroom discuss the need for a graduate assistant or like a technology resource assistant to manage the chat and to respond to those online students. And, you know, it was feasible with our classes, but it would be handy and it would be helpful. We just didn't have the resources or the money to, um, to offer that in our classes. And either way, you know, um, students have identified to us that the class goes on, the students are um, flexible in their attendance. They, they like the idea that if something came up, they're sick or they had, had uh, multiple students that um, got concussions from sports this semester. So, you know, with um, conflicts and emergencies and going to the hospital, like it's just very nice. I've had multiple students express that it is very nice that they felt that they could still be flexible with the class and because their life was so um, complicated this semester. Overall, students ex expressed very positive responses. There were only a few that were negative in nature. And um, some of those I feel were just a uh, bias towards the gen ed course because uh, many students do not like the idea that they have to take a gen ed 
course that's required for them. It's non-major specific. And um, so I always get negative feedback with regard to that. But um, if you exclude those students overall, it was very positive. Um, students still communicated to me, which was interesting, whether they were going to attend or whether they were sick or, um, you know, what was going on in their life if they couldn't make it. And it tended to be the ones that were already coming to class in person. It was just part of their nature. If they couldn't make it in person, they still emailed me to let me know and um, communicated that with me, even though they weren't required to. With regard to consistency, and um, we found, you know, even though students said that they were flexible, they tended to stick with the same method of attending. So each week I would say I had the same five or six students that always attended class. Then there would be a few that would just come to class that they were confused. Um, the Zoom was not as consistent as the students that attended in person and um, the asynchronous students tended to just stay asynchronous the whole semester. I did find that the beginning of the semester assignments were completed earlier and students were doing them ahead, ahead of schedule on their own, which didn't really happen in the past. Um, that tended to die down as the assignments got more complicated and, um, and we went through them together as a semester got more busy. And with regard to cooperation, you know, I had multiple students who would log in to join the Zoom together I'm, um, some of them were roommates and they were in the same class together while others were friends and they would join together. And so those students um, also expressed that they would reach out to one another and ask each other for help if they had questions. So there was a lot of students working together that I noticed more so than, um, than I had in, the, in my past courses, probably because they could ask me questions during class if they were, if they were there. Um, so we're still, you know, working our way through analyzing all of this data, but we um, are basically completed and we're just waiting for some of our stragglers to complete turning in that last survey. But what I shared with you is the data from the 38 students that have responded. So a, a little bit over half. Um, do you have any questions for me? I'll stop sharing my screen. Yep, there's one so far. Uh, do you think incoming freshmen would have the ability to be this responsible? They struggle with time management so much. That is something that uh, it would really depend on the student. I, I could say there, you know, all of these students were juniors and seniors, and there were a few sophomores, but the classes that we were teaching were 300 level. And um, we still, we still had I would say a handful of students in each class that definitely shouldn't be in and given the option. But um, you know, at that point, they they are paying for the school. They are, uh, you know, adults in nature, and they should be able to choose. Um, but I, I do believe if you're going to implement it, you should start it with your higher level classes and see how that works. Um, I'm not sure how well that would work with freshmen. That would concern me, depending on the type of class that it is. Maybe if it was with freshmen, you could make it a little bit more structured, like we were discussing. Maybe students don't decide each day, but your class is hybrid. Um, in that it does use all three models, but you can choose, you know, this class is asynchronous and these are the activities that you'll do. And the next class is in person. And these are the things that we're doing. So it could be more flexible where we're not meeting every week, but it's um, predetermined by the topic and by the activities and, and how you want to structure that class. I know with my colleague, there was one day where they had a speaker in the classroom and she said to her students, I would really appreciate if you would come to class in person this day. I know it's a hybrid, flexible model, but today I want you to come to class. And she had almost all, but a few of them come in person. Um, so that is that is something that we're we're still trying to struggle with, but um, I think you'd have to you'd have to really plan it out with the faculty that are teaching the classes and determine, you know, really pre-setting and pre-structuring all of the content uh, upload, you know, in advance. It's a lot of work, but then once it's already pre-set, it's like building an online class. 
but making sure that those students can still engage in person and trying to make sure everybody is involved um, that would really help. And another thing that would help if you're trying this with freshmen, I know I was expecting the juniors and seniors to have a little bit more self-efficacy and motivation, or maybe my expectations were higher, but that's why I used the Google folder. So I didn't grade as much, but I gave a lot of feedback throughout the throughout the course. And so one thing I would change is making smaller assignments and grading them like every single week, having something due, because I found that a lot of students procrastinated. And even with my feedback, they weren't making the changes for their final project until Saturday night when the project was due this past Sunday. And we worked on it for you know five weeks. So um, that would be another change is that I would make sure that there are more smaller actual graded assignments because if they weren't graded, the students weren't really spending the time on them because they didn't think it was as important because it didn't impact their grade. And I, I was hoping for more of an intrinsical motivation to um, use the feedback and make those changes even if it wasn't worth a grade until, you know, three weeks later. Thank you. Um, so someone commented, I've tried this method in a math class and what surprised me is that offering high flex for class meant the students expected a bit more flexibility in the testing arrangement area. Do you or your colleague have any thoughts on testing methods that would work well with high flex classes? Well, both of our classes were more qualitative, you know, in nature where we didn't have time tests for them to complete. They were more project-based learning. Um, and so we can't share our experiences with testing, um, but one thing that we do have is a, um, is a student support center where students can go take their tests. So making it flexible and that they could choose a time and day within a you know, specific week might be an option where it's proctored by somebody in our testing center. Um, or you can make the test, since it would be accessible by all, it would be an online assessment that everybody would take and it would be timed um, where they have to complete it you know, within a certain time frame so that they're not taking it earlier than others and then possibly sharing answers with each other too. Um, you can also pay for proctoring services, which if you have the money, that would be great. We, um, we are very limited on funding right now, but I know that you can um, pay for an external proctoring service and then they would work through your LMS and um, you could share the tests with them and they could proctor the students on those as well. Thank but that you. would be something, yeah, you'd probably want to talk to um, your director of learning, online learning departments, and see what um, what's possible with that. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question. Uh, were your assignments due on a weekly basis or at the end of the semester? So for my particular class, I had an assignment week one, week three, week five. And then again, week um, seven and 14. So it wasn't every single week, but I had um, smaller assignments due at the beginning. Then we started working on our bigger projects. So for some examples of the assignments, this class is in preparation for their um, professional life. So they had to set professional goals and they did that on their own and turn that in electronically. They um, wrote a cover letter, they updated their and revised their resumes. Um, turn those in. And so that was all the beginning of the semester. And then starting week seven through 14, we worked on um, collecting data through literature reviews, and they turned in an annotated bibliography that I checked. They turned in their interview questions that I checked and graded. And then they also turned in their consent forms for interviewing. And then they worked on their own to um, collect that data and analyze that data and turn it into a presentation that was due this past Sunday. So if I were to revise that, I would have done, um, I would have broken up that presentation into smaller chunks and had them turn, and I'd done that in the past, but I didn't want, um, I thought using the Google Drive would help prevent 
multiple grades for the same assignment. So I was giving feedback on the assignment along the way. And if the student didn't have work on their project in their folder, I would email them and try to set up a meeting with them, but sometimes students didn't respond. And so um, what I would change is I would just eliminate the Google folder. I would have them submit their assignment and in parts and segments and make those smaller amount of points, but were some points so that they would actually turn it in and I could provide feedback that way. So then students aren't procrastinating as much. Um, so it is creating more work well, with the grading, instead of just providing feedback, you'd provide feedback and have a rubric or some type of way to provide a grade with that as well. And that would be one thing that I would change if I taught this class again next, sem next semester. Thank you. We have one additional question. Um, how would you coordinate the participation assignments between classes? Um, so those taking it live online versus those that are taking it asynchronously? Um, how would you, how would you coordinate the participation assignments? So all of the assignments that we did, if it was like a discussion, we had as a discussion board and everybody typed into that together if it was a question. So whether they were on Zoom or in person or online, they all use that same discussion. Um, discussion board. So when they were in class, they would type into the discussion so that students on asynchronously could still read that and respond. And we did give points and grades for them to engage in the discussion. But we didn't do points for attendance if that was, you know, with regard to participation. We just kept track of how did they engage in the class? How were they attending? But we did not give points for their attendance. And that was hard because you couldn't tell when they were asynchronously, if the class is two days a week, you could not tell um, if they actually logged in two days a week. Um, you could, but then it's just a lot to look into in the in Moodle, at least, and how the metrics work. So you could see all the days that they logged in and you could see how much time they spent in the course. But after looking at the correlation, because we did track all the time that they spent in the course, and um, unless a student only spent like 20 minutes in the course throughout 14 weeks, that those were the only ones whose grade was actually very low. But um, the, other than that, there was no, if you took out those outliers, there was no correlation between the amount of time they spent in the actual course shell. Um, there might be if we had more discussions and assignments that were actually due in the course. And for mine in particular, since I had them working in their Google folders, that might have um, messed with the data a little bit because a lot of them were working on the class, but they weren't in the class. And so that data of how much time they spent in the class was not really telling me much because they were working in their, in their Google Drive on the projects. Um, and so that would be the other thing I would take away the drive if I did want to track how much time they were spending in the class and take attendance and, and you know, making sure that they were logging in both days or two days a week. Um, but again, that would be a lot of time spent. And I don't, based off of what we found, I don't feel like tracking the days that they were in the course is that as important. So I would just stick with assignments that they had to submit for a grade each week. Thank you. Do you have any closing remarks before we wrap up? Well, I just think overall it was a really interesting, you know, type of way to teach. It is something that I wish I would have planned more for in advance. Um, it was kind of, you know, hey, let's try this strategy and see see how it works and collect data on it. And I was kind of building the class, you know, building the, the ship. I had the all the presentations. I knew the content that I was going to do. And I knew the, the projects that I was going to have the students work on. But I wish I would have, you know, if I were to do this again, I would have taken more time to plan out and make sure that, you know, how is a student engaging each and every single week, whether they're asynchronous on Zoom or in person and making sure that it is equal because I do feel that I did leave out that asynchronous group a little bit that they could have had a better experience. And so that would be one thing that if you plan to do this, um, having a template, you know, you could create your own lesson planning template, but making sure you're asking yourself every single week, how is each type of student engaging in the course 
so that everybody is actually getting an equal um, getting an equal chance to be involved and engaged in the content. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for attending today. If you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our Learning and Growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the Learning and Growing website, which I'm going to go ahead and link in the chat right now for easy access. Uh, we will be emailing you a link to the recording of this webinar once it becomes available, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you.